And uh, But uh, this morning I'm going to go a little bit slower at first anyway because we're going to cover a bunch of verses of Scripture. And um, I want you to keep your Bibles open. And let, how many got your Bibles? Let's raise them up here. Let's see. Oh, that looks pretty good. I believe I don't see a few little empty spots here and yonder. But it's a blessing to be able to have a copy of the Word of God. And if somebody next to you, and they come here regular, now, not a, not a visitor, if they come here regularly and they don't have their Bible, uh, punch them hard right in the ribs, and then let them share and look on with you. If they just brand new and they've never been here before and they don't have a Bible, just let them look on with you. Okay? Um... Uh, Read that scripture. That's what will set you free. Now, I'm glad I'm saved this morning for a bunch of reasons. I'm glad I'm saved this morning because of that peace that Brother Page was talking about a while ago. That's just here and now. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven to have that. I'm glad I'm saved this morning because I am going to heaven and going to get to live forever and ever and ever in a perfect city with a perfect environment. That's what Hollywood movie stars are doing with all their money. That's what rock singers, they're trying to buy themselves a piece of heaven. If I can build me a big mansion and have pretty greenery around it and water squirting up in the air, different color lights on it, and have all kinds of exotic foods and, and come in Rolls Royce and everything, they're trying to build them a little heaven. They might as well forget it. Even if they could build one close to it, they're going to get cancer or have a heart attack. Something's going to kill them. And so you might as well just serve God now and wait on your heaven. And I'm glad I'm going to heaven and saved because of that city. Then I'm glad I'm going to heaven because I don't have to go to hell. I'm glad I don't have to go to hell. Boy, that's enough to rejoice over forever. But I'm also glad I'm going to heaven because as a Christian, I will miss the most terrible time that's ever been on this world. The most, I believe, that we are approaching the most terrible, horrible nightmare that the world has ever gone through. I don't believe World War I and World War II will be a drop in the bucket compared to what I'm going to tell you about this morning. Back in the old days, the Civil War and the, the days of depression, man, they, that was a Sunday school picnic compared to the time that I'm going to read you about this morning. I'm going to read you about this morning what the Bible calls the wrath of Almighty God. Now, friend, you ain't never had no trouble till God Almighty begins to pour out His wrath. Jesus said the world had never saw a time like this and would ever, ever see it again. This is going to be the worst time in the face of the history of the face of this world. Now, you can look around in our generation and tell, if you're very observant or spiritual-minded at all, that we are approaching a definite, some kind of a, a holocaust, some kind of a, some kind of a chaotic, uh, judgmental, some kind of a catastrophe, brother, in the next 20 years or so, or 30 years or so, or maybe five or six years or so. I'll guarantee you one thing, things ain't going to keep going like they're going now. We'll either see a move of God and a revival or people will turn to God or else God's going to begin to wind this thing up. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, the Lord gave some signs and He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then He gives a list. And every Check on that checklist was almost 20 of them, I believe, are happening all, to, all the time commonplace in our generation today, which lets me know we are near the coming of the Lord. Now, if you've never studied the book of Revelation, let me give you the divisions of the book right quick. The only way you can ever understand the book of Revelation is learn to divide it. It is in division. And you must learn to rightly divide it. Hold your place there in chapter 15 and turn back with your left hand and look at chapter number 1. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and you'll see where God told John to write a book. 
And he said in verse 19, which is the key to understanding the book of Revelation, he said, you write this book in three parts, John. Part of it's past, part of it's present, part of it's future. Now, you must understand where John was when God told him that. John was caught 1,900 years into the future up in the Spirit of the Lord to the day of the Lord and seeing the wrath of God. So God said, John, write what you've seen, what you are seeing, what you're going to see. Three divisions of the book. Look at verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. Past. He was looking back on the church age. And the things which are looking down on the day of the Lord or the wrath of God, the tribulation. And the things which shall be hereafter. The, pre- the, the judgment, the, the millennium, and eternity. Three parts of the book of Revelation. The first part is chapter 1, 2, and 3. Turn to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Chapter 4 and verse 1 gives you the beginning of the second part of the book of Revelation. Everything in chapters 1, 2, and 3 have been taking place for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, if you want to know where you are, everybody listen. If you want to know where you are in the book of Revelation, you are in chapter number 3, verses 14 to 22. You're in chapter four, uh, chapter 3, verse 14 to 22. That is the seventh or last church, the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means civil rights or rights of the people. And in the last days, everybody is going to be hollering about their rights. The Lord said the way you're going to know when you're in the last days is everybody's going to say, I've got my rights. You know, uh, uh, the, the black people won't write. The gays won't write. The women won't write. Uh, the poor old dirty white trash like us won't, won't write. Everybody says, I've got my right. I've got my right. And the Lord said, that's it. The last church. The church of Laodicea. And all of these civil rights movements and demonstrations and burning buildings down and throwing bricks through people's windows and, and demanding this and demanding that is a sign that we're near chapter 4 and verse 1. You see chapters 1, 2, and 3. You see the word church, 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 over and 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 over. Now, in chapter 3 and verse 22, the last word is what? Churches. Something happens and the church, word church is not found anymore in the book. It's gone. In chapter 4, verse 1, there is a rapture. John, being a type of the church, goes up into glory there, and he said, Come up hither. The word come up hither found three times in the Bible. You've heard me preach on them before. They represent three raptures. But here's the one we're going in, in chapter 4 and verse number 1. Now, you got that division right. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the first division. Chapter 4 begins the second division, and nothing, are you listening? Nothing from chapter 4, verse 1 on has ever happened. We are in chapter 3, the last part. As soon as the Lord comes and takes us out, chapter 4 begins, and even though we see famine, and even though we see people putting marks on their heads, and even though we see hear wars and rumors of wars, these are simply uh, forerunners and preparing the world for what the world will see from chapter 4, verse 1 on. Now, turn to chapter 19. Chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 19, verse 11 is the middle part of the book of Revelation to the second advent. And in chapter 19, verse 11, the Lord comes back in power and glory and begins the third division of this book. So where we're going to be studying this morning is 15 and 16, right in the middle of that second division. And that division is called the wrath of God, the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of the end, and on and on and on of things like that in the Word of God. It is called God's wrath. Now, there are things happening now that are preparing us for this time. There's going to be monsters come out on the earth. 
There's going to be gooblins and goblins and all kinds of scary creatures. Yes, sir. Come out on the earth. And, man, you talk about... You remember Alfred Hitchcock movies and um, all of these things. Where do you think Alfred Hitchcock got the ideas for his shows? Where do you think they got the ideas for the Twilight Zone? Where do you think they got the ideas for Night Gallery and uh, all these spooky shows and interplanetary battle star, uh, you know, wars, ba- Galactica, E.T., and that, all that stuff's really going to happen, man. Now, somebody thought up E.T., but they didn't think him up really. The devil looked down here at one of these demons and he described him. Now, everything the world makes out there is a pattern of something that really does exist. You just can't see it. Everything down here is a pattern of something up there. Everything we see on this earth is a picture of something in heaven as far as the church is concerned. Everything bad is a picture of something in hell or the pit. I believe, do you know why rock and roll singers fix themselves up like they do? They don't even know. Turn back to chapter 6. Revelation, I believe it's chapter 6, I ain't sure. No, chapter 9, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter number 9. You look here. Revelation chapter number 9. I want to show you how, why, um, Kiss, back in the 1970s, began to be, put big teeth in their mouth and grew them on a rubber tongue and placed their face up. I'll tell you why they did that. Look at chapter number 9 and verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded... And I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. Now, old Charles Manson, he thought these stars falling from heaven was the Beatles. And there's you know, those four angels loose in the, from the bottom of the pit. Charles Manson said that was the Beatles. And I don't really, really, I have heard better Bible expositors than Charles Manson. And I wouldn't put too much confidence in any sermon he preached from the Word of God. He was wacky, man, or he is. Well, I'll tell you something, friend. Hey, that old boy's connected up with some kind of demonic spirit somewhere or another, and there's no doubt about it. You know why? You know why when you pick up a rock album and read the words on it or hear it on the radio, why they keep talking about God and the Bible and Armageddon and hell? Brother, they're all connected in this thing in the book of Revelation. You looking at it? Revelation 9, verse 1. Well, that guy there had the key, the bottomless pit. Now, what's a bottomless pit? It's a pit that ain't got no bottom. You understand that? And, brother, down in this pit that ain't got no bottom, that's deep. Now, you got to pay attention to hear these, to understand these deep sermons. I tell you, brother, it's a pit that ain't got no bottom, and there's demons and devils and all kinds of scary imps live down in this thing. And, brother, look what happens when he opens it up. Now, he ain't opened it yet. We're still back in chapter 3. But after the Lord comes, He's going to open it. Look at chapter 9, verse 2. And He opened, uh oh, the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit. It has the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts, watch it now, upon the earth. And unto them was given power. They had a lot of power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, what are they going to do? Verse 5, it was given to them that they should not kill them, people, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Here's when a man will try to kill himself and can't kill himself. Can't even commit suicide. Verse 6, and in those days shall men seek death. Oh, Lord. What a horrible day. What a terrible day that'll be. And shall not find it. And shall desire to die. And death shall flee from them. Watch verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. What does a bunch of horses prepared unto battle sound like? Settle that a million times that deep and that loud. Almost like big gigantic speakers with woofers and tweeters and mid-range blasting your eardrums out. 
Their crowns like gold. Uh oh. They had something on their heads, and their faces were as the faces of men. They had a face like a man. But that ain't all. They had hair as the hair of women. They sound like a bunch of horses. They've got faces like men. They've got hair like women. That ain't all. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Well, hello, Twisted Sister. How'd you get in there? I thought you didn't come out until a few weeks, months ago. No! John done saw it long, long time ago. That ain't all. They had breastplates. I wonder why them guys dress like they do. You know, with studs sticking out all over them, you know, and breastplates of iron and these bracelets on you. They try to look like, uh, they try to look like scaly creatures. Amen? Verse 9. They had breastplates. As it were, blessed breast plates of iron, and the sound of their wings, uh oh, as them guitars, was as the sound of chariots. So sure ain't got no tune. It's a chariot and many horses running the battle. Now, while that does represent little literal creatures that I described to you this morning, that what we're seeing nowadays, Matt, have you seen cartoons lately? I mean, brother, here he comes in and there's this big giant interplanetary sorcerer from who knows where. And brother, I mean, the big kids about 10, 11 understand that. And then they got, bless his heart, little Papa Smurf for the little ones. And he's going to vex everybody and hoax everybody and psych everybody out and got these supernatural powers from here and there. And here comes a uh, uh, big He-Man or somebody and they're going to smash the villain and this great big old serpent rules over the worlds and they're going to destroy him and they're shooting lasers back and forth and they're sorcery and witchcraft and all that. Brother, we are preparing a generation of young people. We are preparing right now. I thought about that. I thought, what are the ages of these kids? 10, 11, 12 years old. If, if I understand the Bible right, they are the generation being prepared for the great tribulation, the wrath of Almighty God. There's uh, no doubt about that all these things are forerunners. You say, oh, Brother Danny, that's just a fad. Hey, man, whatever happened to Bugs Bunny? I mean, the cute, funny cartoon. Whatever happened to Heckle and Jackal? And old that did all. And Bullwinkle. And all of them guys. Cartoons nowadays are not to entertain and make them laugh, but are to portray a philosophy. They're preaching. They're preaching a doctrine. And that doctrine is, you kids, if you're going to survive, you're going to have to get some contact from outer space to help you in interplanetary Star Wars movements to take you into outer space, live off pills, Live up these supernatural, the old values of the home, the old values of the family, the old values of the church are outdated. Do away with them. We are preparing for the worst generation and wrath that this world has ever seen or ever will see. Now, the word wrath means anger or fierce indignation, violence, anger, or to lose your temper. Some people say, boy, I like old so-and-so, but man, when he loses his temper, you better get out of his way. Hey, what's going to happen when Almighty God loses his temper? God, you say, well, Brother Danny, I ain't never heard nothing like that. God is a loving God. Somebody's told you a half of truth. Somebody said you're the baloney because they want your money. You know what makes preachers do that? Money, brother. They want a salary and a car and a house. And they figure if I talk to these people nice and not upset nobody, I'll be taken care of. You better not listen to a devil like that. 
A man that just tells you God is love and everybody's sweet, all is well, there's no help. The Lord bless you. God bless you. Man, he's a crook. Man, talk like that's a crook. You better not pay attention to that nut five minutes because I'm telling you, this Bible says a lot more than God is love. The Bible said there's a blistering burning hell. The Bible said God is angry with the wicked every day. Somebody public schools and colleges where you get that junk from. They wouldn't know the truth. They heard it. Half of them. I'll tell you what God's looking at. God's been pour, storing up His wrath for 2,000 years. The Bible said He's angry. He's angry. I heard a guy on the radio the other day and he said, we quit preaching these judgmental sermons or something like that. He said, uh, when I see people nowadays, I tell them that God thinks they're beautiful. I don't need to read anywhere in that Bible where God said we is beautiful. You can't show me that in a book. Brother, I don't even think them are beautiful. You don't think I am. Unless you're some kind of a pervert. I can't hear you. I'm telling you this morning, friends, brother, we ain't beautiful. You, hey, you say, well, I'm beautiful. Don't, don't take a bath for three days. Or comb your hair. You stink like a dead dog. Roll rotten sinners! Better, the sooner off we realize that, the better off we'll be. We'll stick out our chest, boy, like we something. No, we ain't. We ain't. God don't think we're beautiful. God looks at us as fallen, depraved creatures outside of help, outside of hope. Unless the redeeming act of grace, brother, lifts us from our sin. That's how God Almighty views us. He sees all of it. Now, when you see wickedness, it's worse than, worse than hearing it. We hear about wickedness, and it bothers us. You know that? We just hear about all the sin. Man, you read the papers, you hear the news, you think, Lord, all these terrible things that happen, how's God put up with it? i tell you something, brother. He don't only hear it, He sees it. You say, how come that's worse? When Moses was up on top of the mountain, he had the Ten Commandments. And he's getting ready to come down the mountain. He heard a big racket down there. And the Lord said the people had made him a god. They made him a false god. He heard about it. That was bad. He heard about it. But he went on down there and kept his cool. But when he saw it, he got so aggravated and frustrated, he threw down the tablets and broke them. It was a lot worse when he saw it than it was when he just heard about it. Now you think about what God sees every day that this old world goes on. God sees all the false religions. God sees those people down in, in Mexico and places climbing by false religions on their hands and knees, on broken glass, on sharp rocks, climbing up that mountain and to, to give that statue some money, drop it down in there where some crooked low-down priest can get the money and go blow it on some wine. God sees all of the false religion in this world. He sees them crawling up to the temple of Mecca and bowing down to Buddha and some old fake dude like Guru Maharaji or, or Sun Young Moon or some reprobate like that taking people's money in the name of God Almighty and living like the devil. God sees all of the scientists who have given themselves to prove the Bible is not true. God hears them blaspheming and curse his name. I don't know long ago when I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago. There's a bunch of old college dudes out there. I, man, I couldn't stand the thoughts of it. There's out there and one of them well, kept saying, Jesus Christ as a curse word. And boy, every time he'd say that, man, my skin would just crawl. I thought, boy, if that boy says that one more time, there's about five of them. And I said, if he says that, I'm going to do something. I don't know what. But man, I can't stand the thoughts of that, taking the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and just blaspheming it, making fun of it. And I tell you, God hears every bit of it. Brother, wicked, persecuting the poor. There's poor people out here that are being taken advantage of all over the country. I mean, old rich, low-down, sorry men taking poor women's money. I heard about one of them fake healers and evangelists. I read, the, I saw part of the letter who sent a letter to one of the one of the patients down in Broughton Hospital. And brother, that patient, a patient in Broughton Hospital. And he told that patient, if you don't send me so much money 
by a certain such a time, bad things are going to happen to you. And terrible things are going to come in your life. I tell you what, man, if I was done, oh, Lord, I mean, up there and see a guy do, I mean, taking advantage of a crazy man. Tell him bad things are going to happen to him if he don't send him money. God sees every bit of that. He sees men worshiping themselves, this pleasure, mad sex crazy world. He's seen all of that fornicating adultery that went on from here to Hollywood last night. God Almighty saw it in 3D, brother, right down in the park car, in the disco, out in the hell holes out in Houston and Dallas and Los Angeles and New York. Don't you point your finger and say God's a mean God. God Almighty's been up there with outstretched arms of love for 2,000 years saying, come unto me, all you that labor in the heavy laden, but me and getting more wicked, drinking liquor, swapping wives, telling lies, cheating in court. Brother, God has every right to pour out His wrath on this ungodly world. He sees them pleasure, mad, lying, cheating church members who care more about a scratch on their new car than they do their neighbor going to hell. God sees every bit of the fake. God hears their wheeling, dealing preacher. God sees every abortion meal where they're taking a little unborn baby and taking their life and busting their arms and legs off because that low-down mama can't control herself and don't want to face her responsibility. God sees every bit of it. I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a car and I asked the other day and I, man, that was a Paul Harvey ought to get it, get it on there. It said, unborn women have equal rights. And I said, amen. Them babies got a right to live. Mama said, I've got my rights if I want to kill my... You've got your right to kill yourself. You, you want to kill somebody, kill yourself. Let the baby live. Amen. You ain't got no right to kill that baby. I'm telling you, brother, God sees every bit of it. He sees the porno shops. I mean, people out there in Texas, them big fancy houses. You know them J.R. and people on Knott's Landing like, like people with perverted minds enjoy? You know, like black-hearted people like to watch? You're hearing me, ain't you? I'm telling you this morning, they're out there partying with German shepherds, brother, and bringing party dogs into their house and committing ungodly acts with their women. Your heroes, some of you. Don't look at me and say you're judging your foot, man. God Almighty said, if a woman shall lie in front of a beast, it is an abomination. He'll put them to death. God said if a man lie with a man, it is an abomination. It was capital punishment. The Bible. Funny. Funny how people claim all the good parts of the Bible. John 3, 16, quoted from daylight till dark. But you don't hear many of them quote Leviticus. It is an abomination. It is an abomination. That's why God's going to pour out His wrath. Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15. I think we're going to make this a two-part message. <laughs> As I'm now getting to the Scripture. And finally, through that introduction, now I'll preach. <laughs> if the Lord will help me. Revelation chapter 15, and look here, and verse number 1. Boy, I done ruined it for some of you. You're sitting there saying, oh, no, I won't beat the Methodists of the fish camp. <laughs> I'll tell you what you can do. Go be a Methodist. Amen. You'd probably make a good one. We need the room. I'm telling you this. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't really mean it. I'm not trying to run you off. But it's better to leave and sit here and grab all the time. I'm telling you this morning, look what he said there in Revelation 15, 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. It's a great and marvelous sign. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. Here it comes, the wind up. For in them is filled up. Now, that was a very key word of Scripture, filled up. See, the only reason God ain't pulled out his wrath right now is the cup ain't full yet. He's been storing it up. Stored it up. Every time he looks down, he sees crooked politicians and low down a scoundrel and liars. And see, he's putting a little more wrath in that cup. 
Here in Revelation 15, 1, it's filled. It's filled up. Just like it squirts a gas tank full of fuel. It is full. Now, verse number 8 of chapter 15. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Here we go. Chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, stop right there and we'll read verse 2. Right here's these angels. Seven of them lined up across here. These seven angels has got the seven vials full of the wrath of God. Vials like a like a thing there, like a vase or like a little bowl or something. Here's the angel number one. He's got part of God's wrath. Here's angel number two. He's got part of God's wrath. Here's angel number three. He's got part of God's wrath. On down, seven of them. Got the wrath of God, the last plague. I want to tell you something, friend. You don't want to be around when this time comes. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, man, you are in a heap of trouble. If you don't get right with the Lord soon, the rapture is going to come. Chapter 4 is going to take place. We're going out to heaven to miss the wrath of God. And God will begin to deal with this world. And you will be here if you don't get killed when the wrath of God is poured out on this earth. You know what scares me, preachers? You know what scares me, Brother John? What scares me is that if, if some parents don't take this seriously, there may be kids sitting in here right now that will actually see this thing come to pass, what I'm preaching about today. They actually may see it happen literally in real life come to pass. And there's no way I could tell you how bad it's going to be. Here goes. Verse 2. First angel... The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men. Not all men. Upon the men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them which worshipped his image. So, God says, go. The first thing he takes off. He takes his vial. He pours it out upon the earth. Now, at this time, it will be the time when the Antichrist is reigning on the earth. His number, as you can read in Revelation 13, has to do with 666. That's his number. That's why they put it on goat's heads and the pentagrams on the albums that you see. That's 666. Six. You don't believe it? You see Brother Keith over here, he blow the top of your head off with some of the rock album stuff he's got. I'm telling you this morning, friend, that number 666 comes. It has to do with a man and the number of his name. So he says, everybody, if you're going to buy or sell, you're going to have to have this mark in your forehead or in the palm or, or on, the, on your right hand. You must have the mark of the beast. So when God begins to pour out the wrath, the first thing He does is allow men who have the mark of the beast to get sores on them. One day they wake up and say, Man, I'm hurting right in there in the crack of my elbow, right back here and behind my knee. And boy, an old sore will come up. Have you ever had a big old sore? How many of big ones? I don't know, bicycle wreck. Leave a big one about that big on your elbow. You ever seen somebody that's wrecked on a motorcycle? Slid down the highway, about as far as from here, the street out yonder. They ain't got a bit of hide left on them. And y'all have, they just, big old realm. Looks like pizza, man. Their, their, their back or their face. That'll make you wait and hear me out a little while. Kill that appetite. Brother, I tell you what, they have big old sores on there. You peel them scabs off, just old pus. I run it in there, and I mean, it's just an old sore. And it won't get better. Like a boil 
Have you ever had a boil come up? It's got a white spot in the middle of it. And brother, that thing's so sore you can't touch it. That's what's going to happen to the people who take the mark of the beast. Now, there's a lot of things I could say there. That could be a whole sermon. You can make a whole sermon out of that. Let me say this. That tells me, you listening, that God does let certain diseases hit certain people because of what they do. Somebody asked me, did I believe that AIDS was God's judgment on homosexuals? And I said, absolutely I believe that. I believe that. You say, preacher, what about all them people that got it that ain't homosexual? That's what they get for fooling with homosexuals. Amen? You say, what about all them babies who get it who ain't got no choice in the matter? That's like a mother having a baby who's a heroin addict. That baby's an automatic heroin addict. It ain't that baby's fault. I'll tell you something else. If they come out with a cure for AIDS, God's got a bunch of new diseases they ain't never thought of yet. He did it to the Egyptians. You read that Old Testament. If y'all spend more time reading Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus as you did with Phil Donahue and reading Time Magazine and what the experts say, you might find out what's going on in this world. God said back there in the book of Exodus, He set out diseases on them Egyptians. You know why? They were sodomites, brother. They were homosexuals. They swapped wives. They prostituted their daughters. And if you fool around, you better watch them who you fool around with. You kids better watch who you start to marry. You better, you better pray. I'm not glad people are suffering. And I don't glory in the fact that those people are having to go through that. It hurts me! I'll tell you one thing, friend. God's going to get it through this, our noggin, one way or the other, that you can't just live any old way you want to and get by with it. There is a price! Now, in the tribulation, they'll have the mark. I personally believe the mark will be invisible. I can't prove that. But I believe it for several reasons. They're already trying that for one thing. Did you know in Sweden, in Sweden, that now Sweden leads the world in sin. You ever heard the old saying, there's something rotten in Denmark? That is, that, that is true, man. That is, that's where the legalized uh, prostitution and you can't whip your kids, a bunch of perverts. Now, when something starts in Sweden, it ain't long till it gets to the United States. In Sweden, there have already been tests, according to the report I had, that over 6,000 people had taken a mark. Not the mark, a mark, just as an experiment. This mark would include your bank account number with a certain prefix and tell how much money you got in the bank and you buy or sell according to what that number determines how much money you got in the bank. Just like a charge card or a bank card, except so you won't lose your card, they put it on your body. Now, I believe it's invisible because the Bible said no man can buy or sell unless you have the mark. They won't even know if you've got it. So you got to buy something or sell something. Now, when this sore falls on people, they're going to say, and inquire, and midnight, and star, and sun, they're going to be running stories, oh, the new epidemic hits these people, these fine people, hits senators, hits lawyers, hits bankers, hits clergymen, hits all kinds of great people in the world. It's the strangest thing. It's the worst epidemic since AIDS back in the mid-80s. And they're going to say, here it is. And they're going to run stories about this and run stories about that when all it is is God's first angel has poured out his vial upon the earth. I don't know what the population ratio as far as taking the mark of the beast will be at that time. In other words, I don't know, I don't know if 
75% of them will have the mark, or 25% or 80 or 90. It may be, it may be that high. But I know that God will begin to pour out His wrath, the first thing, by those sores getting on their body. And they'll try ointment. Can you imagine these ladies who spend all their money trying to be pretty? And brother, I mean, they ever new cream, man, aloe, herbal life. Everything that comes out, they try to buy. Well, if I can rub this, it'll give me youthful-looking skin. God's going to give you some skin like an old hag one of these days because all you thought about was your looks and your beauty and your body when God said, think about that soul. Think about where you're going. You're going to get wrinkled. You might as well accept it. There ain't enough mud in Eckers, man, to cover them up, neither. Like a, you heard about that fella that took his wife to get her a, her face fixed up a little bit. They charged him $75. That was just for the estimate. That was one of Brother Ricky's there. Said another guy went to his wife. She got her a mud pack. Looked pretty good for three days. Then the mud fell off. I tell you, you imagine these raving beauties. And here comes uh, Lonnie Anderson <laughs> or Brooke Shields, and they got a big sore on the side of the thing. You know what I bet? I bet old, old uh, Cindy Lauper and, and Madonna and them, somehow or another they'll put jewelry on them sores, and it'll become a fad. Yeah, like a hickey. You know, or a pimple or something. They say, I'm cool, man. I got braces. See my sore? Well, I wouldn't put it past them. Like, you can make anything a fad if you're rich and famous. Some of y'all looking at me like, like I'm crazy. I, that's a matter of opinion. I may think you are if I listen to you talk for 30 minutes. That's the first angel. The wrath of God. Jacob's trouble. Well, let's move on. Verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. See, the first one got the earth. The second one gets the sea. That's salt water, I imagine. Because he gets the clear water and the, and the kind fresh water in the next verse, but we'll not take time to mention that right now. In verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. All the life in the sea is going to die. When that second angel comes flying over, he's going to dump his out on the salt water. It's ever going to get blood red. Can you imagine those guys down there at the coast? Got them shrimp boats out there. Oysters, got nets out, man on his cruise ship, Navy, Marine, airplane pi pi uh, pilots flying over. And there's a funny red tent starts coming in the ocean water. You see, all, all the movies and everything nowadays are preparing our minds for that day coming. People, you couldn't have put that off on people 100 years ago. But nowadays you can. You know, that water starts turning pink. You know when the space shuttle blew up a few weeks ago? Man, it, it was all over the world just like that. All, I mean, they interrupt this, this programming to bring you this emergency bulletin, CBS, NBC, ABC, man, satellite coverage, everybody in the world. That's the way it'll start being. It's there's a strange occurrence in the city. And that stuff's going to get blood. And people will panic. And people will scream. And people will cry. And people will say, Oh, God, what's happening? And since that bunch of fanatics disappeared about four years ago, the world seems to just went, Wow, it went crazy. Unleashed hell. By the acre. Boy, people begin to holler as the water turns to blood. 
God beginning to judge man and stubbornness and wickedness for his sin. It'll cause a famine. All the people live off seafood. The Bible said in Proverbs 13, 25, The belly of the wicked shall want. Man, there's coming a famine on this earth then. You can check that out with chapter 2 and all those, I mean chapter 6 and all those overlap each other and they complement each other. Just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All these things will be taking place upon the earth. What I said to you this morning, I'm going to stop right there. The Lord willing, we'll take up right there tonight and see what happens with these next five angels. Son, we just getting started. You wait till mother five hit the stage. And I told you enough this morning to let you know. Whatever, what I've said this morning may sound like a fairy story. It may sound like a movie. It may sound like a book of fiction. But it's the truth. My concern is for you this morning that are here, not ready to meet the Lord. God wants to help you this morning so you won't have to go through this terrible time. Please, ladies, let's stand with our heads back.